Well, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, based on the interest in this um, webinar, uh, it's a topic a lot of you are um, interested in and wanting to know more about. And so we have uh, gathered this morning our two experts on our continuing care agreement and our life care promise. So um, we're going to get started here. Um, my two colleagues and uh, two gentlemen I consider as my friends as well, uh, David Tiesinger and Adam Kinder are gonna do a presentation. Uh, there will be an opportunity for question and answer. So <clears throat> along the way, if you have questions, if you would type that into the Q&A box, not into the chat, but into the Q&A, that way we all can see it, that are the panelists here and we'll do our best to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, to, um, to get it, uh, to, an to answer them at the end. Um, but I'm joined by the sales team, Victoria Carson and Vic, uh, Cindy Price here at Bretton Woods and Kathy Rebel at our Raybrook campus. So uh, we're welcome and uh, we will follow up. If you have questions about it, uh, we'd love to hear those. And, and more importantly, if you have an idea on a topic that you've been really wanting us to talk about and address, we would love we would love to hear from you. So let us know uh, if you've got some uh, desire to to understand or have us highlight something. But with that being said, I'm I'm very happy to welcome David Tiesinger, uh, the Chief uh, Strategy Officer for Holland Home. I, I'm I'm I keep struggling to say that title because he's been CFO for uh, 30 years, so we're still getting used to his new title. Uh, and you'll see his bio there. Um, certainly, he's been all over Holland Home. He's been here 35 years, and uh, we're really um, happy he could take the time to be with us this morning, along with Adam Kinder, um, who's been with Holland Home five years, and he is our new uh, chief financial officer, uh, graduate of Calvin, and he was the former CFO of Agility Health. So, Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to them, and um, we'll let you guys uh, take it from here. All right. Thank you, Michael, and uh, welcome to the uh, webinar. Um, I'm not going to pretend that anybody knows anything about Holland Home, so I'm going to give a little uh, a 101 uh, on Holland Home. So in front of you, you have a uh, an organizational chart of uh, Christian Living Services. So Holland Home is actually... Um, owned by a holding company called Christian Living Services. And Helen Homes along the left-hand side of this page. Uh, we have uh, our Breton campus, um, our Breton Woods campus, our Raybrook campus, uh, Fulton, which we're currently in the process of selling. And then we have our uh, foundation, which is there to support a charity care within the, the resident population of Helen Home. Uh, then we're also associated with uh, Faith Hospice, and um, uh, Reliance, uh, which provides waiver services and Trillium Institute. Uh, those are wholly owned 100% uh, by Christian Living Services. And then we have a uh, partnership with Care Resources, uh, which is a local PACE program, uh, Tandem 365, which does population health management. And they actually work under contract with Priority Health and Blue Cross. And then Atro Home Care, which uh, has two certified home health agencies, uh, to support the West Michigan population, one in Grand Rapids here and one uh, located in Holland uh, along the lakeshore. And in the private duty agency help that at home. So that's everything that uh, when we talk about Holland Home is at your disposal uh, for services. Uh, Holland Home is actually the 69th largest uh, nonprofit multi-senior living facility in, in the nation. Um, uh, we've been around for 129 uh, years. We were founded back in 1892. So I think that's one thing to keep in mind where uh, our plan is to be here for a while. Uh, and, and we've been here for 129 years already. Um, located pretty much in the Grand Rapids area. Um, we have uh, three uh, communities that are active today, the Bretton Woods uh, campus, the Raybrook campus, uh, and in Trillium Woods where um, Faith Hospice has their inpatient hospice unit. Um, two of those facilities are, are life plan communities. Um, we, uh, we do have a debt rating by uh, Fitch, um, which is a triple B minus, uh, which is an investment grade rating. The interesting part of that is there may be 
4,000 senior living communities across the United States. There's only about 170 of them uh, that have a rating um, and we have an investment grade rating with that. You can see in the chart there, uh, the size and uh, of the organization, we have 1196 um, different uh, available apartments and settings for care. Um, and that'll actually bump up to 1,211 uh, here in June when we open our third um, adult foster care unit on the Breton campus. So as far as facility-based and community-based services, uh, we offer independent living, assisted living, memory care, rehab, uh, skilled nursing, and both our, our Raybrook and Breton um, campuses. Uh, and then inpatient hospice services um, are out at the, the hospice unit at Trillium Woods. Uh, community-based services uh, can be provided both uh, for folks who are living in the community or in our facilities. So uh, Atria Home Care, uh, Faith Hospice, uh, Care Resources provides uh, services to people who are living at home, who are um, uh, on Medicaid and meet um, uh, eligibility for nursing home care, but want to stay at home. Uh, it's a nice program that we have in partnership with a few others. Uh, waiver program that's provided by Reliance, and then I've talked about Tandem 365, uh, which helps kind of navigate uh, health systems and, and helps you manage them through those. So we're gonna talk a little bit about um, continuing care and what that means. So there's, a, there's actually an, an act, a law, called the Continuing Care Community Disclosure Act. And uh, the act was uh, from 2014. It actually became effective uh, April 2 of 2015. And it replaced the prior act, which was the, the Living Care Disclosure Act, which was enacted back in, in 1976. Uh, and really what this law does is it um, is there to give um, the State of Michigan Corporation Securities Bureau um, the power uh, to really prohibit uh, fraudulent practices and to impose penalties uh, if they find those uh, as it relates to life care agreements. So every year we go through a process where we actually register um, and really file almost a securities filing with the Corporation Securities Bureau who oversees this. Uh, there's actually 32 uh, registered facilities um, in the state of Michigan. Uh, 29 of those are facility-based, three are really home-based. Home um, some of these uh, continuing care retirement committees or life plan committees were providing care uh, long before the act was put in place back in 1976. Um, and of all those facilities, there's almost 11,000 uh, different units uh, spread between independent living, assisted living, and skilled nursing. Helen Home uh, has about 11% of, of those units at 1,196. You may be wondering um, who are these 29 facilities? So I've listed them there. Um, Helen Home, incidentally, was the first registered facility in the state of Michigan. Um, you can see our registration number is, is uh, uh, 10,000, or it's actually zero. It's the first one there. And you get an idea of the size of, of each of the units. Grand Rapids area, uh, West Michigan area, um, really has a lot of, of life plan communities um, around, which is great. That means uh, the population seems to be well educated about this, uh, but there's uh, six different facilities within Grand Rapids and then we have some in Jenison and Holland and a few down in Kalamazoo and then uh, the rest tend to be on the, the east side of the, the state there. It's important that if you're not on this list, you're not registered as a life plan community, which means that you don't offer it. You're probably just a rental uh, month to month situation, which is, which is an alternative for you. So uh, every prospective resident, and we're hopeful that everybody's on this call is a prospective resident that, that wants to know something about how uh, a life plan community works, uh, should be provided the disclosure statement. Um, and uh, you get this well in advance of making any decisions. It's like a prospectus if you were to buy uh, a mutual fund uh, investment. Uh, 
it basically goes through and talks about um, all of the contractual obligations of, of both the, the provider uh, and the resident. Um, the, the key to this is you should get this disclosure long before making the decision of whether you want to actually enter into an agreement. So what's in this disclosure statement? Well, there's a few things that are required um, under the act. And, and one is to let you know that uh, the continuing care agreement or life lease uh, involves a, a high uh, level of, of risk. Um, and risk is really defined as cost. Uh, there ends up being entrance fees that are paid. Um, and so that's a cost use to the state wants to make sure you understand that there's a, a a high degree of risk. Um, they're also suggesting that you should seek advice really outside of the life plan community um, to really review these agreements. Uh, while they're all based on uh, a certain law that's out there, there, there are some different nuances with them. Um, so they're really saying seek advice from an attorney or financial advisor, talk to your family members uh, or people that uh, you can seek counsel from that aren't necessarily um, with the facility. Um, know that that entrance fee that you pay with any life plan community is subordinate to the uh, any mortgages that the facility had. And that's part of that, that risk that you take on. And then know that uh, through your discussions, and we have very capable, qualified uh, sales team, sales consultants that you're working with, um, no person is really authorized to make any promises uh, other than those that are actually written within the disclosure statement. So if you hear something from uh, a discussion with somebody that's not consistent with what's in the disclosure statement, the, the disclosure statement is, is what uh, is true and factual. And so uh, just understand that that's how that works. We're going to talk a little bit about the, the continuing care agreements. We're going to review kind of our entrance fee programs talk a little bit about some of the monthly uh, costs that are associated with us on, on this webinar today. So the continuing care agreement, really when you break all of this information down and just think about the basics, there's really two things that it provides. There's a lot of information in there. It can be overwhelming as you look at all of the data, but when you break it all the way down, it's really two things that are the most important. One is that um, it provides access to our nursing facilities or other levels of care basis on a basis of priority of somebody who doesn't have a contract. So in other words, if you have a continuing care agreement with Helen Home and you're living in one of our independent living areas, you have access to our nursing centers or our assisted living facilities based on somebody who doesn't have an agreement. Um, and, and we make sure that you have that availability for you when you need it. And then in addition to that, um, if for some reason you're in those levels of care, higher levels of care, and they get expensive, um, there's no question in my mind that it's very expensive to be in assisted living or nursing today. If for some reason you exhaust all of your ability uh, to pay for those services, uh, we have a process to review that and determine whether or not there, we can provide some, some uh, discounted um, fees to you uh, through our benevolent and charity program and allow you to continue living here, getting the care that you need uh, and an amount that you can afford to pay uh, based on the resources that you have. And so those are really the two basic provisions of what the continuing care agreement provides. So, so why is access uh, to how and home important. Um, and, and this is really a key. Uh, first of all, our how and home nursing facilities, uh, both of them, the Bretton Woods and the Raybrook campus, are five star rated quality facilities. Now, nobody goes into a senior living community thinking about the healthcare component. Um, uh, you're going to look at different campuses, you're gonna look at the, the beautiful different options you have on apartments or homes. And, and it's like moving into a new place to live. Oftentimes the last thing in your mind is the healthcare component. We don't wanna think about it. Uh, we never see a line at the front door of a nursing facility of people waiting to get in. 
Um, we don't desire that. That's something that we don't really uh, think about. But just know that in, in Holland Home System, um, if you need those services, uh, they're second to none. Our, both our facilities are five-star rated. Um, both facilities are on US News reports, uh, best facilities in the nation. Um, and a lot of it has to do with our, our desire for excellence. And a lot of that goes back to staffing levels. And you see this little grid on this page and in Holland Home Nursing Facilities this year and our budgeted plan of how we're gonna run them, we budget them at 4.1 hours per resident day. Uh, and you see a bunch of other statistics about typically what you see in for-profit nursing facilities, some other nonprofit facilities. Even if you look at the bottom of this page, uh, state of Michigan last reported the average is 3.5 and Kent County is 3.6. So fortunately in the West Michigan area, we've got some very good nursing facilities, but again, we, we think it's very important um, to provide the highest level of care we possibly can. And that's, that's important. If you don't live in a Holland Home facility and you want to get into our nursing, uh, it's possible. Um, it's possible that it could happen, but it's not guaranteed to you through a contract. You may end up uh, in a different facility that doesn't provide the high level of quality services and staffing that we do. So certainly key in point, uh, um, point in all of this is access to our facilities. Another reason is about 75% of our, our nursing rooms are private rooms, and really we're on a plan to move to 100%. Uh, it's just taking a while for us to get to that point in time. All of our assisted living rooms are 100% are private rooms, and all of our memory care assisted living, 100% uh, of those rooms are private, uh, private rooms. Uh, Holland Home is also the first facility uh, in Michigan uh, to receive the designated uh, organization uh, from TIPA Snow uh, under the positive approach to care, uh, which is a really high level of uh, designation for uh, dementia care. And 100% of our staff, including myself, Adam, Michael, everybody in the sales team, everybody in our facilities, housekeeping, dietary, um, our administrative teams, and those providing care, I'll go through the dementia journey uh, training for staff. It's how do we um, how do we handle people dealing with uh, dementia and memory care issues? And we've made a, a total commitment uh, to being able to provide the best care possible for those dealing with uh, a dementia. So certainly a reason um, to to have access to Helen Home. Going to give you a little demographic um, story here. Um, if you think about the aging uh, population of the United States. Uh, there's a little box there that's uh, highlighted uh, for the 80 plus category. Now, many of you are probably younger than, than 80 or maybe approaching 80. But uh, in the year 2020, there were 13 million people in the United States that were 80 plus. By the year 2040, uh, that number will be up 113% to 28 million. That's a, that's, a, that's a huge increase. And if you look at the, the cohort or the age group of seven, 65 to 79, just below that, that's up another 10 million. So as the population in this 20 year time period goes up by 41 million, 25 million of that is for really retirees, those who are older. Um, that's just an amazing graph of demographics. So I think it's important to align yourself if you're thinking about getting into senior living uh, with a community that, that provides a, this broad level of services, no matter where I am, and uh, has really a commitment to excellent quality services. And the reverse side of this is really what's on the next page. It's, it really talks about caregiver support. Uh, today, there's about 6.3 people uh, in, in the age group of 45 to 64 that are really caregivers uh, compared to every, per, every person that's over 80. Uh, over the next 20 years, 2020 to 2040, uh, that number really gets cut in half. So as you think about um, options, hey, do I really wanna move into a senior living community or do I wanna just live um, in my home or a condo? Um, 
I think one of the things uh, that I think about is, is if I need some sort of service, whether it's long-term or whether it's episodic, is over time, can I even get access to, to somebody to actually provide that care to me? Um, and I think that's, that's going to be a real challenge going forward um, as we look over the next uh, 10 to 20 years here, uh, that this is going to be a, a challenge that any one of us have at this point in time. Um, and then I think if you think of your kids, uh, oftentimes uh, your kids uh, uh, are working and may not be able to provide that, that care for you. Uh, so I think that's just a big challenge going forward. But I want to talk about one other thing too, as it relates to uh, to this too. Um, the the uh, the number of uh, people that work for Holland Home, we do not use outside agencies. Um, so I think if you're if you're comparing us to others in the area, um, just recognize that uh, Holland Home has its own staffing agency. We're committed to. Um, providing care for people who work for Holland Home, uh, not uh, really employing a staffing agency to get staff or to provide care. And I think as it relates to caregiver support, um, we have made a huge commitment not to use outside agency staff. We wanna be able to provide care with people who are committed to our mission um, and not use uh, outside agency. Um, so now I'm gonna turn it over to Adam uh, to talk a little bit about entrance fees. Great, thanks, Dave. Uh, a few things uh, as we as we talk about entrance fees here uh, before I get into kind of our, our three different plans here. But so in, in every single one of our entrance fee plans for independent living, it basically has two components. So that's that's how we should think about it. There's a non-refundable component and there's a refundable component. And Dave later on will get into that. Uh, so we have three basic entrance fee plans available and each one is going to vary the percentage that's the non-refundable and the refundable piece. Um, so in each, each case, we have a 35-65 or 35% of, of the entrance fee is non-refundable and 65% are refundable. We have a 50-50, which is just as it sounds, and a, we call it a 75-25, where 75% of the non-refund, 75% of the entrance fee is non-refundable and 25% is refundable. And each of these actually has a different net entrance fee um, for, for the individual unit. So think of it this way, the higher the percentage of the non-refundable, the, um, the lower the entrance fee. So, and really that's, it's all towards uh, designing uh, opportunities to get into our communities um, that are as affordable as possible. Um, and so this is where as we talk through some of these different entrance fee plans, this is where we encourage people to really um, work through the financial exercise uh, with their advisors, um, anyone that they, they consult with that they would, that they would trust. Uh, we're obviously here to help provide guidance uh, and walk people through kind of selecting what entrance fee plan might, might make the most sense uh, for them once they've kind of decided on a unit type that they really like. So here's a couple of examples uh, just to highlight a little, a little bit of specificity of what I'm talking about. So an example here is a terrace, which is a Bayberry, um, uh, one bedroom, about 960 square feet. So in the 75-25 plan, you see the overall entrance fee is $154,000. So the non-refundable in that case would be 115,000. The refundable would be about 38,000. So the other way to think about this too is that the non-refundable also essentially represents your cost. The refundable is something you'll get back once you vacate the independent living unit. So as we talk through these, think about uh, the number uh, immediately to the left in the brackets is essentially the cost in this case. So in the 50-50 plan for that Bayberry, $181,000 entrance fee, you know, the non-refundable is 90 and a half thousand, the refundable is 90 and a half thousand. In the 3565 for that same unit, the entrance fee is much higher, uh, 201,000. The non-refundable piece, the overall net cost to you is much lower at about 70, 70,000. So the refundable piece is about 130, 131,000. So that's where you know, we, we design these plans so you can see how somebody could stretch to get into a Bay Bear if they needed to at the 7525 uh, level, or they could, could play with some 
some finances on their side to say, well, maybe I want to do the 3565. Maybe I want my, my non-refundable to be as low as possible, my refundable to be as high as possible. It really comes down to what makes sense uh, for you financially um, and, and what, what might it take for you to get into that specific independent living unit. So we can flip to uh, the next here. Uh, so Homes North, uh, really there's there's one kind of nuance here and that's Bretton Homes North where instead of a 7525 plan, we have an 8515 because Bretton Homes North is a new development. Um, and these are all being kind of, as people sign the CCAs, this is how they're being constructed. We, we couldn't get the economics to work at a 7525 on initial construction. So, but the, the 8515 works very comparably to kind of how all the other plans would work uh, to from an overall mechanical perspective. So we wanna to go to the, the next one. Uh, entrance fee ranges. Um, one thing I really wanna note here is if you look at the Raybrook campus, you know, our lowest cost unit would be a 7525 entrance fee plan. Uh, and that would be in a States to Electra, which is about 600 square feet about $75,000 is the overall entrance fee in that case. The highest cost on the Raybrook campus would be a 3565 plan, uh, and that would be a Cygnus, which is just under 1,800 square feet, $360,000 entrance fee. Bretton Woods campus, our lowest cost would be a 7525 plan, uh, which is an Aspen at about 120,000, it would be the entrance fee. And then our highest cost is one of the Bretton Homes North units, which is a Laurel at you know 2,700 square feet on the 8515 plan, which is about $760,000 entrance fee. The, the one thing I really wanna note here though, is it's not like we just have one of each of these on our campuses. So the Electra example, there's eight of those on our Raybrook campus. The Aspen example, there's 19 of those on our Bretton campus. If you look across our whole kind of portfolio of our independent living units, um, when I looked at it, you know, we have uh, about 35% of our total unit portfolio as an entrance fee cost of 175,000 or below, uh, potentially. Um, so when we talk about affordability, we try to be very serious and intentional about this. We want to always look for opportunities for people to get in. Um, one of the other things to note too is as part of, as part of the kind of admissions process, as, as you're looking to, to figure out what makes sense, we do require a financial disclosure. That's not, the financial disclosure isn't intended to be an exclusionary tool. Uh, it's intended to be in, as inclusionary as possible. It's to say, okay, help us understand where you're at. Help us make sure that you're finding yourself into the right entrance fee plan. Uh, we wanna be able to get to a yes, but we don't want somebody who has very little in assets, very little in income, to say, yeah, I want the Bretton Homes North Laurel, you know, at 760,000 and they just ate up all their assets. Um, we wanna make sure you're getting into kind of the right type of unit for you and to help guide you. We don't even wanna show you, if you can't potentially afford a unit, we don't even wanna necessarily show that to you. Um, but we, we use the, the disclosure really to help guide folks um, into, into getting to yes. We very rarely, get a disclosure in which we say, no, there's, there's absolutely no way, you know, you'd be able to fit financially into, into any of our available plans. We really try and get as creative as possible. So when, when, when you get asked for that financial disclosure and know that it's not um, intentionally to try and exclude somebody from the community, it's just to make sure uh, that you're fitting into um, the right, the right unit type and entrance fee um, for you kind of thing. We do, that's, that's to say on occasion we have said, yeah, you, you, we're really gonna to struggle to fit you into a specific unit, but we always try and get the yes. A uh, couple other things, uh, entrance fees can be adjusted uh, depending on kind of the, the add-ons that may be available in a specific unit. So really most of these features are typically available in the Raybrook homes and the Breton homes, and those could be uh, completed lower levels, uh, porches, three season rooms, fireplaces, well, there could be an elevator in there. Um, generator add-ons, those kinds of things, and those may impact uh, the overall entrance fee you may pay. Um, those those can be added on to if they're not if they're not already in the unit. Those could be opportunities for you to potentially upgrade the space, uh, which which would come at a at an additional cost to you as well. Second person fee. 
Uh, so when we talk about the second person fee, there's really two options from a second person fee perspective. There's the non, you can pay a one-time non-refundable of $30,000, or you can pay $350 per month, uh, which you would pay until the second person is no longer permanently residing in the independent living. So really what it comes down to is, 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 is that as you're looking to add a second person uh, onto the CCA, so a couple, say so think, think, of, think of a married couple in this case, Really, this is this is about you having a conversation. Sometimes a a, a a very honest conversation with each other. Say what makes sense. A, it could be contingent on whether you're asset rich or income rich. So if you're asset rich, maybe paying the thirty thousand dollars makes more sense than paying the three fifty per month. If you're income rich, maybe paying the three fifty per month versus the thirty thousand um, dollar one time it makes more sense. The other the other element here is. Uh, kind of having that honest conversation and maybe one spouse um, you're relatively certain they may need a higher level of care sooner rather than later well maybe it makes more sense then to pay 350 per month in that case because maybe odds are that spouse may be moving into assisted living in the next three to, to five years and in that case financially it probably makes more sense to do the 350 per month versus the thirty thousand dollars up front or um, you could say, hey, we're, we're both in great shape. Um, you know, we're going to do the 30000 per month, um, not the $30,000 the 30, one time. Um, so this is, this is just another element to have that honest conversation. And again, the, the sales team is there to help facilitate some of that conversation too, because this is, it's, it's, gonna, it's new for you trying to work through this, and they've seen it um, play out hundreds of, of times. And so there, there's a, a resource for you as you walk through each of these specific decision points. Okay, I'll uh, take over here again. Um, the non-refundable amount, Adam referred to that as a cost. So, you know, whenever I look at buying something, the money I don't have after I paid it is my cost. That's what that non-refundable amount is. Now, it, that re non-refundable is used um, over uh, at one and a half percent per month. So if you, if you paid an entrance fee, and after one year, um, you left Helen home. You passed away, you moved uh, closer to the kids that were someplace else. Uh, the non-refundable, even though it says it's non-refundable, is refundable. It's used up at one and a half percent a month. So after one year, uh, roughly 18% of it is used up. That means uh, the balance of, of that, the 82% the, um, uh, that's left, would be refunded. Um, so it's important to realize that that non-refundable is amortized at one and a half percent per month. Um, part, another part of the, the non-refundable is it's considered a prepayment of future care. So what you're doing is it's, it's not paid in a monthly amount, you're paying it upfront, but it's a prepayment of future care. It may be deductible as a medical expense in the year that you paid it. And that's important to realize. We, Helen Home, uses that money uh, over your life expectancy uh, within our organization. And because we account for it that way, um, it may be used as a medical expense. So uh, the IRS says you should, you should do an actuarial study to determine what that percentage is, but that's not really feasible for um, an individual or a couple to do. And so the IRS has said, you can actually use the percentage method for figuring that out. So when you come in, there's some information that we provide to you that, that we've received from Plant Moran, our auditing firm that, uh, that did some research that found um, most of the data that's out there related to deductibility. And you can review that with your, your tax person, your CPA to, to figure out what that is. But typically, our medical expenses run about 50% uh, in a year. So if you had a $200,000 entrance fee under the 50-50 uh, plan and 100,000 of that's non-refundable, uh, about 50% of that or 50,000 could be deductible in the year that you paid as a medical expense. Um, so realize that, that uh, that's a big deduction, $50,000 that you're offsetting uh, income in that particular year 
Um, that's another important reason why you need to, to talk with your uh, financial advisors about what might be better for you. Because then if you go back and look at those different plans, maybe you want to maximize what that non-refundable amount is because of the medical deduction. Uh, maybe you don't. Um, so that's something to kind of keep in mind. Um, compare uh, contracts between life, life plan communities. Um, so Holland Home takes the non-refundable amount and we amortize that at one and a half percent a month. So that means after 67 months, it's fully amortized, it's fully used up. There are some uh, life plan communities um, that amortize 100% of the entrance fee at one and a half percent up to the refundable amount, which means that it's used up twice as fast. So you're burning through more of the refundability of the non-refundable um, faster than what you realize. Most people probably aren't looking at the details to even pick that out. Um, but if, you, if you're looking at comparing Holland Home to others, we know that there are others in the Grand Rapids community that do this. And it's costing you twice as much um, uh, it's, it's used up at a faster period of time. Now, if you end up living someplace longer than 60, 70 uh, months, it really doesn't matter at this point in time. Um, but if you're dealing with, um, you know, some life expectancy challenges, and that's why you're moving into senior living, this may be something that you want to take a look at um, as far as how that works. Uh, the refundable amount, so not the non-refundable, the refundable amount, um, that is refunded back to uh, the resident, your the resident, uh, at the time that you move into a, uh, you vacate the apartment um, or the home and you move into a higher level of care or you terminate your continuing care agreement and move outside of Holland Home or you've passed away. So you vacate the unit um, and then uh, it's either moving into higher levels of care, you pass away, or you terminate the agreement, move someplace else. So when is that refunded back to you? Well, for all of our units, with the exception of Bretton Homes uh, North, it's within nine months, or at the time we, we place another resident in occupancy of that unit that you vacated. Bretton Homes North, it's actually 18 months. So those are higher entrance fees. They take a little bit longer to sell. Um, so it's 550 uh, 50 days. Uh, those, re not, those refundable amounts are reduced by a sales charge of 6%. State of Michigan under the rules says that you can charge up to 8%. So that's again, look at the contracts if you're comparing us to others. Uh, those percentages are all over the map, but it can't be higher than 8%. And then refurbished costs equal to, to greater than 4% of the entrance fee or actual. And that comes right out of the state law. That's something we don't really control. Um, we're just following the state law with, with that uh, to charge it that way. Uh, and then another thing to keep um, uh, comparing to if you're looking at other places is that the, the new Continuing Care Disclosure Act that went in place in 2015 allows you to, to set the date of the refundable amount to the, uh, up to the time that you actually resell the unit. So, and it's not date specific like, like our contracts are at nine, nine months. Um, so it could be at resale. So understand those agreements when you look at them. It could be a much longer period of time if we run into a situation where the real estate market's not real well and people are not coming in. Um, it could be a long time um, if you're subjecting yourself to uh, the facility reselling that unit, it could be years. Um, and so make sure you review the contracts as it relates uh, to that provision. Adam. Great, so a few more things um, to, to note as we walk through a couple other elements of the CCA, we'll talk about you know, right of occupancy, adding a spouse to an agreement, uh, ownership uh, of the unit, uh, access to licensed facilities and options for payment of the refundable. So let's talk about right of occupancy. So occupancy is uh, quite simply, it's a limit to the person or persons named in the agreement uh, as the member. That's ultimately who, who is um, available to occupy the living unit. 
And I'll talk about uh, marriage. So oftentimes uh, you'll come in as a, as a couple and uh, or you may come in as a single and all of a sudden you're living in a place where there's other singles at your age and you may decide, well, you know, I'm going to I'm going to get married. Uh, that happens a couple of times a year, it seems like here at Helen Um So you can actually add a, um, a person, a spouse to your agreement. Um, um, by adding them, you can only do that kind of one time. So if you come in as a couple, your spouse passes away and, and uh, you're widowed for a year or so and you meet somebody else and you want to, uh, to get married and um, you can certainly do that uh, by adding that uh, person as a, a spouse to your contract. Um, whenever that happens, just understand that uh, when when you add a second person to the agreement, that that spouse uh, becomes a member, um, becomes a life plan member, and uh, for all purposes uh, is responsible for all the rights and responsibilities and obligations under the agreement. Um, and even if you're a couple uh, looking at coming into Holland Home for the first time, and maybe you're already in a second marriage, um, just understand that uh, when both parties of uh, um, a second or third marriage uh, join, there may be a prenup agreement that's out there. Uh, Helen Home is not a, a party to those prenup, prenuptial agreements. Um, and so understand when both parties sign an agreement, you're both on the hook for all of the expenses for both both uh, members of the couple for as long as they live at Allen Home. And so uh, um, we'd be happy to walk through that if, if you have a particular situation, but we've run this run into this situation in the past where, you know, uh, her stuff was her stuff, his stuff with his stuff, and they were gonna each keep it separate. But when you both sign the agreement, you're signing the agreement as a couple and both responsible uh, for the costs associated with that going forward. Uh, ownership. So there's really two things uh, to note regarding uh, ownership of the living unit. So Holland Home, in all cases, retains ownership of the living unit. The continuing care agreement doesn't uh, grant a change in title uh, of any of the real estate uh, in connection uh, with the execution of the CCA. So really, this is this is about the continuing care agreement. Um, it's not about uh, real estate. Uh, so access uh, to licensed facilities at Holland Home. Um, this is this is really key. This goes back all the way to the beginning when we started talking. When Dave kind of noted um, how how the demographics continue to shift, um, and access to licensed facilities, whether assisted living or skilled nursing, may become harder to come by um, as as we move through the next you know decade or two. Um, as, as supply as, as supply will likely not necessarily keep up with with demand for those services. So um, the continuing care agreement ultimately grants you access to uh, Holland Homes licensed facilities. So you come to a scenario in which, um, you know, one spouse notices that the other one is struggling a little bit more with activities of daily living. Um, the, the one spouse is is more challenged in, in maintaining that primary caregiver role. And it may start to make sense to have that um, struggling spouse assessed uh, from an activities of daily living perspective. Well, we have a very objective uh, level of care assessment where we'll come in, do an assessment, understand where um, where the where the ailing spouse uh, may be at from an activities of daily living perspective, and then that'll serve as a basis to have some honest conversations about whether it makes sense for that individual to then move to a higher level of care. So be that. Uh, assisted living, or in some cases, even bypass assisted living, um, and maybe go to skilled nursing based on severe deterioration. So that's, that's to say that we maintain this objective tool. Uh, kind of the beauty of Holland Home is that we are there to walk alongside you as these life changes occur. Um, and that's, that's really what we're incredibly good at. Um, and we have incredibly skilled staff uh, to help walk you through what all of this means as your health conditions may change and as you move through kind of our continuum into higher levels of care. Uh, the other thing to note is as you move through those higher levels of care, you're not required to pay an additional entrance fee. So if you're in independent living, you paid your entrance fee, 
you know, assigned associated with your, your continuing care agreement as you move into assisted living or skilled nursing, you're not having to pay another entrance fee to get into those facilities. You are required to pay, you know, the, the fees associated with, with the services you're receiving. So, you know, you move into a, a scenario in assisted living where you wind up paying a, a daily rate um, for those, for those skills, for those um, uh, services you're receiving. If you're still nursing, you pay a daily rate for those services, but there's no additional entrance fee uh, in those cases. Uh, options for returning the refundable, which, which Dave uh, was previously discussing, really there's kind of two options. So um, if the resident is still living at the time the refund becomes payable, so the, the, you know, you've, you've left your independent living unit, it's been vacated, you're now in assisted living, uh, we would make the refund out to you when the time comes to issue that refund. We pay it to you directly. If um, the resident vacates the unit via passing away, uh, then when it comes time to issue the refund, it's either going to be, it will be made out to the state of or otherwise uh, made payable to the resident's uh, trust. Um, and we encourage all residents uh, as much as is possible to, to explore getting a living trust if you don't have one, um, a revocable uh, living trust. Um, and then uh, it helps satisfy a number of these um, kind of a state level um, settling situations once a refundable needs to be issued um, down the line. Okay, let me talk about uh, financial assistance. So uh, we require that uh, any resident uh, pays whatever the established fees are uh, for the service area that you're in. And most people have absolutely no problem with that living uh, in independent living. Um, it's typically when somebody moves into higher levels of care, memory care, assisted living, nursing, that uh, those costs get to be uh, pretty big, and it's, it's possible that uh, you may exhaust those fees. So um, we have a process for um, applying for um, financial assistance, and, um, and we evaluate uh, each person's situation based on rules we have, but based on the, the individual situation of, of anybody that's asking uh, for support on financial assistance. So we, we ask each member who's in that situation to, uh, to re-up a new financial disclosure. Uh, it's very similar to the one Adam alluded to when you, when you first come in. Uh, we wanna you know, basically confirm that, that you're in a position where you're, where, when you're not able to pay uh, those fees. Um, we want to make sure that uh, we can access any public support that's available to you um, and um, help you with those applications when they're necessary to advise you where we're going. And if for some reason, um, you know, th there isn't anything available, uh, then we will, um, we will come up with a plan for you um, that allows you to, uh, to pay a, a discounted fee or a waived fee. Um, based on that particular situation. To the extent that we provide assistance um, and there's still a refundable amount um, that, that's owed to you, we would deduct that eventually from the refundable amount um, because that's an asset that you have um, that, that which would give you the ability to pay for those services. Um, one thing is we, we're asking each member um, when they sign the agreement that they're not going to divest themselves of, of assets that may become necessary to pay for, for services. Um, and uh, we think that's only prudent when we go out and ask for support to our foundation that uh, we're not asking for, for support of people who have impoverished themselves on their own by giving away all their money. Um, and, uh, we also look at um, this threshold of about $5,000 a year. We know that uh, we're not out after tithers. Uh, we think tithing is very important um, in our lives. And so, uh, um, but, but we're not looking for, for people who are, are getting rid of their resources at the time that they need to pay for care. And so I think that's a big thing. Uh, so transfers on the bottom of this page, transfers to an irrevocable trust are considered I divestment uh, from Holland Home. So there's a lot of good elder law attorneys out there or ones that are out there that um, basically say, hey, take your assets and put them into this irrevocable trust. What you're basically doing is saying, 
taking assets that I have that are available to pay for care and putting them someplace that uh, I don't have to use them for that. And so uh, we would deem that as divestment. Um, and, um, you know, we would not uh, provide assistance in those situations and uh, we would have to work through those. So uh, just know that we have those rules in, in place as most life plan communities uh, do. Uh, independent living uh, costs. So uh, a couple of things to note here. So our current monthly fee um, for the for the Bretton Woods campus is $725 uh, a month. And the current monthly fee for the Raybrook campus is $728 a month. And then there's a, a cable TV uh, component that's that's layered on top of that for both campuses. Uh, the thing to note when, when you look at monthly fees and you're comparing community to community is what's included in the fee. Our fee we try and strip out uh, a lot of the extra. So in other communities, you may be looking at the monthly fee, maybe $2,000 to $4,000 a month. And that includes a meal plan, housekeeping, all kinds of all kinds of stuff. We've really erred towards the side of trying to keep our monthly fee as low as possible. And then there's add-ons available. So if you wanted to have housekeeping services, you know, we, we have those available to you. You'd pay a la carte for those. Um, if you wanna go eat in our, in our dining, uh, areas, great. You can go do that. You kind of pay per meal. That's a la carte as well. Uh, but it's all geared towards trying to drive our monthly fees as, as low as possible. So as you're looking and comparing to other communities, that's one thing to know. The other thing too is your monthly fee isn't um, dependent on which entrance fee you picked or what plan you picked. Uh, it's, it's kind of everybody pays the same monthly fee. Um, there are other communities where the, you may get into these scenarios where depending on what entrance fee you picked, your monthly fee is X and that kind of thing. That's not really how, how we've, we've designed a kind of our fee structure. It's kind of a, a one size fits all in this case, trying to drive it as, as low as possible. So again, affordability has always been, has always been this thing that we hold out intention to try and, and, and maintain an affordable structure for everybody. The other thing too, property taxes those ultimately get passed um, through um, our facilities onto, onto the residents. Those, as they get charged to our independent living, uh, we, we push those out on an allocated basis. That's all spelled out in the disclosure um, statement. So it's, it's a pretty, pretty standard approach. Assisted living fees. This is where if you have long-term care insurance, uh, this is where it may start to kick in. So as you look at kind of our fees, as Dave alluded to, it's assisted living isn't isn't a cheap um, isn't a cheap area to, to receive care in, and neither is skilled nursing. You can see based on your level of care, and your level of care is really an indication of of the volume of services that you're consuming, the volume of staff time that's required to assist you with activities of daily living. You know, it ranges you know at Raybrook anywhere from eighty two bucks to two hundred seventy dollars a day. In the memory care areas, it's as low as one seventy two to two eighty one a day. Um, so it, it can really fluctuate quite, quite wildly based on what it is that you actually need to be receiving as far as services go. Brighton campus, this is just to highlight the, the monthly fees for assisted living there. It ranges really from 192 uh, to 291 a day on the, on the Brighton campus as well. Uh, skilled nursing, a couple of things to note here. Um, residents who are, um, covered under a CCA pay $20 per day lower than somebody coming in uh, from, from the community who hasn't already bought into to Holland Home via a continuing care agreement. So again, these rates vary from you know, $320 a day up to uh, $390 a day, depending on the room, whether it's a semi-private or private room. Um, so again, so th things to note as, you, as you're looking at, at uh, at, at other facilities as well is, is how does their monthly fee structure or how does their daily fee structure work as you move through the, the higher levels of care. Yeah, I'd just, I'd just add on the, on the skilled nursing too. If, if you meet the Medicare requirements, then obviously our facilities are certified for that. And uh, there's no charge for the, the Medicare certified days that are uh, you're entitled to there. Right. Yep. All right. Great. Michael, we'll turn it back to you for Q&A. Sure. Well, thank you, gents. That was a lot of great information. Um, and I know uh, we have some great questions. So I'm going to just dive right into those. 
uh, in the interest of time. So um, the first one I wanna ask is, uh, someone asked, what's the process to continuing care? I want security if I've exhausted all my funds. I don't wanna be surprised when I need it most. Who wants to take that? I can, I can do that. So okay. um, when, when you sign a continuing care agreement for Helen Home, that is the process. Um, so um, signing a continuing care agreement guarantees you access to our facilities. Um, and if you've exhausted your resources, um, not through divestment, but exhausted them through just payment of services, we will continue providing services to you. We don't put you in a specialized unit because you, you uh, don't have the ability to pay. And I can tell you today, uh, we range anywhere from one out of six to one out of seven of our residents um, are in that exact situation. Uh, that amounts to um, three to $5 million a year of, of uh, waived fees that we have because somebody can't afford to pay. And uh, really it's the beauty of the Hell on Home promise is that uh, if, uh, if you come in and commit to the rules of paying for care for as long as you can, and when you run out, those services will be available for you at the same level they are if you were paying the full amount. Um, and we'll do that for the rest of your life. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing that we can do that um, going forward. So that's how it works. You sign the agreement and commit to the, uh, commit to the, the payment schedules until you no longer uh, can pay for those. And then it kicks in at that point in time. Yeah, I, did, I just wanna add from a process standpoint, um, to me, this is that's, I love the question because it highlights kind of one of, one of the most beautiful um, things that is, is Holland Home in a lot of ways, uh, because in that scenario, when you run out of resources, I've, I've noted it as an example of it, and maybe one of the most traumatic experiences of your life. Um, and so we're there to be there um, for you in that moment uh, to make it as uh, painless as possible. And so, um, you know, it's, it's as simple as, you know, noting to, um, you know, one of the one of the directors at a facility to say, hey, look, I'm running law and resources. We put you in contact with the person in the finance team. And then they start to have that coordinated conversation with you to understand where you're at. What does it look like? OK, let's talk through what 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 the monthly uh, structure may need to be. And it's kept um, incredibly confidentially. Um, so the staff that's, that's serving you at a direct care capacity has no idea typically what your wherewithal to pay is. Um, for, for the most part. I mean, the, on very rare occasion, they might have an idea if, if somebody is, is in a particular scenario, but um, we, we take great um, caution uh, to ensure that, you know, those who are providing care really have no idea who may be on benevolence and who isn't. Um, great. Um, th thank you. It, and it, it was an excellent question. It goes to the heart of our whole presentation. So, um, next question, why are taxes and overall costs higher at Breton versus Raybrook? I can, I can address that. Yeah. Uh, first of all, entrance fees are, are um, a little bit higher on the low end, and it really has to do with when those facilities were developed, and it goes back to a construction cost. Um, the, the monthly fees are rel relatively the same. Uh, the property taxes are really what's higher, and it's really driven by um, a scenario that at, uh, at one time, independent living was not taxed. Uh, so when we first um, built a States One uh, back in uh, the mid-80s, uh, it wasn't taxed, and then the, uh, the Grand Rapids City Assessor slapped an assessment on it. Uh, Helen Home actually fought um, all the way to the Michigan State Court of Appeals and lost, um, and taxes have remained. And the, 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 the beauty, I guess, of the loss when that happened was it was actually predated the Headley Amendment, which raised um, sales tax, but capped property taxes, your assessments at, at where they were, and only subject to uh, CPI increases because of uh, changes in ownership. So because the Rayburg campus has been around longer uh, and they had lower assessments way back at the beginning, uh, the taxes can really only go up by CPI. 
Uh, Breton, because it's a, it's a newer campus, those assessed amounts were actually put on subsequent to the Headley Amendment. And, and so we have higher assessed facilities uh, that are there. Uh, and then if you look at the actual millage, um, so the taxes, property taxes are really um, produced by two things. There's an assessed value, um, taxable value, uh, and then there's a millage rate. The millage rate is a little bit higher than the city of Kentwood because they, uh, they don't take uh, income tax uh, from folks at that point in time. And that's what really drives a higher rate. Um, there's no add-on for, for uh, property taxes, so it's a pass-through. Um, and they're fully deductible um, uh, as property taxes for income statement um, or income tax pers perspective. But that, that's why they're a little bit higher um, on the, the Brighton campus. Great. How long can a guest stay with us? Say my brother and his wife visit from Minnesota and they want to come see me for a week. I think that's fine. Um, we don't really have issues with that. I think uh, um, obviously they don't have occupancy rights to live there uh, as their place of residence. Um, but if you have uh, family that are coming to en enjoy time visiting with you, I, I don't think there's any issues with, with uh, a week stay or that sort of thing. Um, uh, if they get longer than than those periods of time, obviously, then then they should take advantage of uh, of uh, guest apartments or hotels that are around and that type of thing. But I think those uh, those shorter stays of of a week or so, I don't see any issues with that at all for the for accommodations, especially if you get room for them in some of the apartment sizes that we have. Yeah. The um. We've gotten uh, this question a couple times. What does it mean that entrance fees are subordinate to mortgages? We've got that question twice. Yeah, just it, it's that's a good question. I'm glad you're asking it. It, it uh, so Holland Home uh, has debt. Um, so we actually have public debt. They're through, through tax exempt bonds, uh, and those those that debt is secured by a mortgage. So if there was ever a time that, that uh, Holland Home was going under, uh, the bondholders have a, a first um, position to uh, the property. Uh, and the entrance fee, the refundable amount, which is an asset to you and a liability to Holland Home, is really secondary toward uh, to those mortgages. So the key thing is, is uh, People like me and Adam, who have been um, at the helm of the financials for the organization, uh, are going to commit to you 100% effort never to get to that position where it's, it's never an issue. Um, and so, uh, Helen Home, I think you can rely on the fact that Fitch has said we're a triple B minus rated organization, investment grade rated, rated organization. We have the resources to continue. Uh, in business. Uh, we're in much better financial standing today than we were uh, 30 years ago. Uh, we have a continued uh, uh, financial plan to keep us solid uh, financially to be able to never be in that situation where a bondholder is looking for an issue where uh, that would be problematic. But that's all it means. It just means that uh, that entrance fee dollars are, are subordinate or in a second position to the first mortgages we have with debt. Yeah. Um, so uh, next question here, does the existence of long-term care insurance influence the cost of the continuing care agreement? Uh, uh, it, it really does not, but we're happy that you have it. Um, so it, uh, it, it, you don't get a discount to the, the agreement. Really what you've got is you've got an insurance plan in place um, that's there to protect you from spending assets um, and really gives you a, an income source to cover long-term care at the point that you would qualify for that in assisted living area. Um. Does the monthly fee change in independent living with a second resident? I mean, you kind of, you touched on that, but maybe just uh, evidently. It, just... It, it, it does to the extent that you've, you've made that, that decision, right? So when you, when you first move in, you have to make the decision if you're a couple coming in there's, or there's two occupants, there's going to be two occupants. You got to decide either you pay the $30,000 or 
one-time entrance fee or you pay 350 per month. At that point, then that 350 per month kind of attaches to that second person for as long as there's a second person in there. Um, but there's no additional like second person fee beyond just what I laid out. It, it's a good question though, because I think when you're comparing uh, to a lot of other life plan communities, uh, there are second person fees that can range anywhere from you know, $300 a month to $750 a month. Um, and I think you see those generally in those life plan communities that probably have more an all-inclusive fee as opposed to an a la carte fee with us. So it's attached to, to, to meals and other services that are there. But, uh, but basically, other than that entrance fee discussion, uh, no, it's, it's uh, it, the, the charges to the unit. So whether there's one person in that unit or two people in that unit, um, it's a standard fee. Okay. Uh, this question, I think it's a question I could probably answer uh, less about finances. Sorry, gents. Uh, uh, he asked the question, um, he's concerned about the restaurant hours being only from noon to 4.30. Any plans to extend hours at Breton? Absolutely. Um, you know, we're just coming out of COVID and everything is kind of, we're, we're kind of emerging. So those hours are going to be expanded um, in very short order. So I don't think that's anything to worry about. Um, your other question, um, there's only one bus per week carrying 12 people to the grocery store. I'm concerned with 400 plus people on site that those 12 spots will be extremely coveted. Um, you know, that'll, That'll be all driven by, you know, if if 24 people wanted to go, we're going to get a second bus. So uh, we've not filled the bus ever. Um, a lot of people still drive and will go on their own. Um, but I would say if we get more than 12 people want to go, we're going to add on a second bus. No problem. Keep in mind, we also have a market on site where you can get um, snacks, meals, cleaning supplies, snacks heavy on the snacks. I like that. So, um, so hopefully that answers your question. Um, so let's see here. Any, um, hang on a second. Um, my computer. Uh, let's see. Uh, what is a Medicaid waiver that came early in the presentation? Yeah, so uh, I talked about that as it related to one of our sister companies with Reliance. Um, so it basically means that uh, if you're living out in the community and uh, you are eligible for nursing home care, but you don't want to move into a nursing home and you're eligible for Medicaid, uh, you can work through uh, an organization like Reliance to arrange for services to come into your home that are paid for uh, by Medicaid through the Medicaid waiver program. Um, it's an exceptionally good program. Uh, if you think about yourself as a medic, as a, a state of Michigan resident, um, those programs uh, save the state of Michigan a lot of money because they're far less expensive in providing uh, Medicaid services to somebody who's living at home than to, uh, to cover those services for them in a, in a nursing facility. So Reliance uh, Community Care Partners, which is a sister organization to Allen Home, uh, provides uh, Medicaid waiver services throughout 13 counties in West Michigan. And they do that for, a uh, boy, Adam, is that are we up to about a thousand uh, people who are living at pretty, homes providing pretty, those pretty care? Pretty close to a thousand now, yeah. Um, and so, uh, but that's what that is. It's, it's a way for us to continue providing those services to people in a community um, that choose not to come into senior living and meet the requirements of Medicaid and nursing home eligibility. Um, great, thank you. Question, are you vegan friendly? Are we vegan friendly? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm friendly to vegans. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, our, our kitchen and our dining staff are very uh, open to trying to meet the needs of um, yeah. residents' uh, dietary, whether it's low sodium, if it is, you know, vegetarian. Uh, vegan, we have done some. Uh, we've, we've just had some uh, that have that need. Um, but 
I think it will, it's all driven by what the need is. So, you know, have we been vegan friendly without vegan residents? Probably not. But with a lot of it, like I answered the question earlier about the, the shuttle, a lot of this is driven by what are the residents' needs? So um, we now uh, currently are self-operating with our dining program, and we used to contract with an outside firm, um, but now we are totally self-operational and our quality has increased um, substantially uh, from what I hear from residents, from my own experience eating there. So it's really, really good. So. Um, so to answer your question, yes, we would be able, we would work with you on, in, on your dietary needs. Um, average age of resident in independent living. Yeah, so I think at, at move-in, uh, it tends to be around 78 years old. It's a little bit younger than that for people who are moving into the homes as opposed to uh, the larger buildings of the, the terrace and the ridge and estates one and two. Um, so basically, and that, that's an average. So, you know, it, it, averages are kind of crazy numbers and you're talking to a numbers guy. Um, you know, we have people in their late sixties moving in. Um, we have people in their late eighties moving in, um, but on average, that's kind of where it is. If you, so that's that move in. Um, if you, if you think about that, the average length of time that people live in our independent living areas is about 11 years. Um, and so we, we can't control that, um, only our creator can. Um, but uh, so if you think about the average age coming at age 78 and you're living uh, 11 years, uh, we have a lot of people who are in, in their 80s who are living it. So if you look at the average age of people who are living with us, it's probably the mid eighties. Uh, I would say 85 to 86 is probably the average of everybody who's living with us. And then obviously we have a lot of people, I think because of the vibrancy of our programming uh, and things that are available uh, through our vibrant living program, we have people actively living in independent living well into their uh, their nineties. Um, so that's a, that's a tough question, uh, but I think at, at entry, uh, generally 78 is about the average age of entry. Um, I'm gonna, we'll, we're gonna continue on just a couple more questions in the effort of time, uh, cause I know we're coming up on 1115. Um, the question here, we regularly give monetary gifts to our children and grandchildren up to the limits set by the IRS. Do these stop because we move into independent living? Yeah, great, great question. I'm glad you're, you're asking it because it's easier to deal with this issue today um, than later down the road. Um, your money is your money. You can do anything with it that you want. What a wonderful thing to be able to, to give those gifts uh, to family members. Our issue is um, if you're in, in the position to be able to do that, that's wonderful. What a, what a great legacy to pass on uh, to your family. And uh, what we're not saying is, no, you can't do that. What we're saying is, if you're giving away money and then expecting uh, to receive charitable care uh, from, from us, uh, that's when it becomes a problem. So, um, and that's where it's different for, for everybody. So I just give you an illustration. You know, if you've got a if you've got a million dollars and, and you're able to give away $20,000 a year to family members and you're never really going to ever spend the million dollars, it's not an issue. Um, great. That's a wonderful thing. But, but if you, <coughs> excuse me, over time, if you're down to $70,000 and you give away $20,000, then there's a little different story there because the the, the obvious answer is you're, and especially if you're moving into higher levels of care, um, there's an issue there of, of really divestment and that money's probably more important to you at that point in time. So I think to know your money is your money, you can do with it if you want. Uh, we will ask questions if you ask for support, we're more than happy to provide it. Um, but if the gifts that you've given away um, is what's putting you in a position where you need uh, the, the support, then it, then it becomes problematic. Um, from, a, from an estate planning perspective, um, 
uh, it's a smart thing to do um, oftentimes is to give those things away. Um, and, and many people will never need um, the, the benevolent services of Howland Home because they've got the resources to, to take care of themselves for, for as long as they live. So that's how we look at it. Great. I'm going to ask this question, uh, and uh, I think there's a number of reasons. Uh, he frames this as the $64,000 question. Why should he choose Holland Home over one of our competitors? That's a good question. Well, I can tell you, um, and I'll, I'll answer it personally. First of all, um, this is where I'm going to move in. Um, it's where my parents and my in-laws have moved in. Um, I, you're not going to find a, another senior living community in Michigan that has the breadth of services that Holland Home has, both um, in our facilities uh, and the services that are provided in the facilities, the quality of care that's provided if you need those higher levels of services. Um, our contracts are, um, I would say, the most cost-effective contracts uh, that you'll find out there, so please compare them. Uh, I can tell you that um, there are some facilities that can't offer the medical deduction because of the way they amortize the refundable amount, um, so take a look at that. There's probably better deductibility on the Howland Home side for that, um, and, and we're fully transparent. Um, we try to provide the greatest level of transparency as we can, transparency we can for all of our residents about who we are and how we operate. Um, when, when you talk about the mission of the organization and our commitment to excellence and following Christ's teaching and all we do, um, I can't speak for that for all of the competitors. We have very good competitors um, in, in the area, so there are good facilities, but uh, I think when you compare our facilities, our vibrant care program, our memory care, uh, the exceptional skilled nursing that's available, faith hospice, HRO home care. Um, and I've worked for this organization for 35 years. Uh, there is nobody that's comparable to, to Holland Home uh, in West Michigan. Um, and I think you can pick spots that maybe somebody's a little bit better here and there, but when you look at the whole package, you can't find a better package in which you've got wrapped up in how long. Mm -hmm. I think Dave, you said it, you said it well, I, I would have um, uh, added uh, to one of the reasons why I even work here, um, which is, which is the mission statement. And, you know, the, the hundreds of people who come to work here every day who kind of live and breathe uh, the mission statement, which is just that the, the pure commitment to excellence um, and serving with love and compassion. I mean, I, I can't, I can't tout, tout our mission statement enough and how much that, that just courses through our veins. And I'm sure other organizations would say the same, but I, I think our mission statement is absolutely beautiful. Um, and that's why I chose to work at Holland Home five years ago. And that's why, you know, I come to work every day um, is because I think what we do is incredible. And I think the communities we have are, are amazing and, and kind of um, beyond reproach in a lot of ways. So um, beyond even all the financial reasons you just highlighted, which is weird for the CFO to even just say what I said. So, and I, and I would add from the sales perspective, we we work with a lot of former employees that choose to work at to choose to live at Holland Home, and if you think about that, I think that's a huge endorsement because employees know, you know, we're not a perfect place, um, but the employees know the warts and all. And we get a lot of former employees that choose to live here. I think that's a huge. I think that's a huge endorsement um, of what we do here, um, personally. Mm -hmm. Gents, do you want to answer a couple of these other questions, or do you want to? We can do I that. Can answer as many as they keep coming at us. I'm willing to spend <laughs> as much time as you need to. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, once in the CCA, I understand I cannot divest. However, are there limitations on my traveling or owning a winter home? Yeah, so first of all, I want to say that uh, um, you, you can divest. Uh, the issue is you can't divest and come and ask for help. So I, I want to make that clear. So it, it, uh, um, you, your money is your money. You can do with it 
what you want to do with it. If if you decide to give it all away with the expectation that Holland Home is going to take care of you at no cost, um, then then you can't divest. But if you have the ability uh, to divest to to give charitably, um, which you know we live in a community where charity is such a a big part of what's going on, and you can do that. Um, then, then good for you. That's a, that's a good thing to do. I think, uh, uh, no, we don't really have limitations on traveling, um, owning uh, another home, but I can tell you that at the time that uh, you may be saying, hey, I'm having a tough time paying my bills, when, when we ask for that financial disclosure at that time, we're going to look at your assets and income. And so if you had a you know, a, a place at a warmer climate uh, than what we have around here. And we're saying, hey, you have this asset that's worth something. Um, you know, we, we would look at that and say, hey, how do we deal with the fact that, um, that, that you've got resources, they may not be liquid resources at that point in time. Um, so it all comes down to what the particular situation is and everybody's situation's a, a little bit different. So. Uh, we have a, a number, uh, there's probably a decent percentage of folks that uh, choose not to, to live through Michigan winters and go to climates that are a little bit nicer. And hey, if you're able to do that, that's a wonderful thing. There's certainly nothing in our agreements that prevents you from, from doing that. Um, this question seemed very specific and I, I don't know the details on it, but uh, it says, if my brother were to move in with me and run out of money, then my money would have to cover his expenses as well as mine, right? And I, I'm assuming with this question that that the brother and the sister, let for the sake of the question, I don't know the details of the situation, but let's say for the sake of the question, uh, David or Adam, that the brother and sister are both part of the continuing care agreement. That's my assumption. Yeah, so, so we have single agreements. We have couple agreements. Couples don't necessarily have to be a husband and wife, we've, we've had situations where siblings uh, have come in, and that's absolutely right. So whoever the members are of the agreement that sign as a couple, um, both members of the couple are full, fully responsible for the expenses and responsibilities and obligations of, of both members of the couple. So if, if one of the, the couple has uh, needs higher levels of care, maybe has limited resources than the other member of the couple would, would as, a, as a member of a couple's agreement, is agreeing to cover uh, those expenses. So any, any financial support, we would look at the assets and income of the couple in determining uh, whether there was support available or not. Um, we would look at both members of the couple. Right. And, and so in those situations, sometimes it might be better not to come in as a couple, but come in as singles. Um, and then, you know, we would evaluate a single agreement separately. But, but um, if it's a couple, it, it's based on the couple's resources. Great. Um, I am not seeing any other questions. Um, so we really, and, and Wayne says, thank you for a wonderful and informative session. I think the level of questions in, uh, indicates people were very interested in this topic. Um, and we uh, will be back. So first of all, thank you to David and Adam for taking your time. It was a, just a wonderful presentation. Um, and I think I'm gonna make both of you available. I, I know you've been open, like if people really have specific questions about this that you would welcome, we could facilitate that a conversation with either one of you um, mm -hmm. if they have some really deep dive questions about the continuing care agreement. Correct? Yeah, we'd be happy. Okay, absolutely. Right. Yeah. absolutely. I just committed, yep. I just committed you on Zoom, so. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, and um, so again, thank you for joining. Um, and we will be back next month with a topic uh, that uh, you'll be getting uh, some information on it here shortly. And um, I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful uh, rest of your day. And thanks for, thanks for joining. Take care, everybody. Have a great, have a great day.